Hello and welcome to the Cisco CyberOps Associate Lab video series. I'm going to be walking through each of the major labs of the Cisco CyberOps Associate Netacad curriculum. So let's go and let's jump on in. Lab 434, the Linux server. So we're going to jump right on in. Again, this is using the Netacad uh, curriculum. So what we're going to be doing is the Linux server lab. The objective is to use the command line to identify uh, what servers are running on a given computer. This we're going to do two key parts, servers and using Telnet to test the TCP services. We're going to only going to be needing the CyberOps workstation. That's going to be as again as a VM. And again, I'm going to have the instructions off the screen as we walk through these lab steps. All right, so I've launched my CyberOps VM. Again, we're going to be logging in as analysts. The password is CyberOps. Again, we're using the official Cisco VMs for this training course. We are in part one, step one, accessing the command line. So step one, A, log into the server. Step one, one, or yeah, step one, part B, access the command line terminal. Down here we have our terminal. That's one of the ways. You can also do it through the application. You can also do it through the search. So it doesn't really matter how you do it as long as you can get to it. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. All right, there we go. So that's done. So step two in part one, display the services currently running. We're going to make use of the PS command. So first let's do PS processes and we can see well, we don't we don't get a whole lot of information. So using the PS command will display the programs running in the background. But if we want to give it a little bit more detail, we could do PS TAC ELF. And you'll notice it gives us a lot more detail. I'm going to scroll all the way up. It gives us our parent or our process ID, our parent process ID. So basically, this will tell you who called it. So to run this, this is what initiated it. And you're going to notice most of them are two because this is what does the initial call for everything else. In Linux, a running program. It's called the process. Here we can see the processes and the parent processes. We can also see the time. So that takes care of step two. Why was it necessary to run PS's root? Well, you're going to notice we didn't do PS's root. If you are required to do it, so sudo PS tag yeah, E. LF again. Password CyberOps. And you'll notice we get our display. If you happen to do your PS command and it doesn't allow you, it says you don't have permissions or whatever the case may be, if you do it with a sudo, you will be able to run the commands as a super user. So that's the purpose of that sudo was to elevate our permissions. So that takes care of step 2A and the question that at the end of A. All right, moving on. Step or yeah, step 2B in Linux programs are called other programs. The PS command will be used to display such process as hierarchies so you can actually see kind of what's going on. So the process information for engine X is going to be highlighted. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do this 
again, but we're going to do it based off of the EJH command. So again, I'm just following the steps in the lab guide, step by step, and I'm going to answer the questions as we work through them. So part step two, part B, we're going to do a pseudo. No oh, joys of having to take a phone call in the middle of doing this. All right, so super, we're going to the user directory. We are doing the S bin. We're doing that is where engine X is. So engine X. Make sure I spelled it correct. I did not. Engine X. Again, cyber. Cyber ops. All right, so that got us our first part because that started. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to highlight that service. So sudo ps e j oh e j capital h capital h. I cannot be lowercase. And you're going to notice it slightly modifies the view. Oh, it lists so many of them. We have our PID, our PGID, and so forth. The TAC EJH option displays the current running process tree after starting the Nginx server. Basically, the process information on GX should be highlighted. I did not see it highlighted. I did not see it here, but. Yeah, I did, I did not see it here, but you can see the way that they're designed is there is this tree. And here at the very bottom is our engine X. All right. I think the guide meant that it's highlighted in the diagram in the lab guide, not highlighted in the display. So how is the process hierarchy represented by PS? Again, it's going to be the indentation. Here's the parent. Here's the children. So here is a good example, system D. These are the children. And you'll notice some of the children have children because they're tabbed in an extra space. So that's kind of how they denote the extra space. All right, so moving on, step or part C. As mentioned before, servers are essential. We're going to be using the netstat command to see communication. Clear. Netstat. And netstat is going to show you, uh, again, output may be different depending on uh, what you're doing with your host and, and whatnot. But it's going to show you the connections, the protocols, the flags, the types, the state is the big one, the inode, and the path. Those are all big ones when dealing with our connections. If we connected out to the internet, we could see additional details. We should be able to see the this portion up here, which isn't populated. So I'm going to a new terminal. I'm going to ping Google. All right, ping. Oh, that's right, because I don't have network connectivity on these VMs because Cisco disabled them. So what happens is if you add internet connectivity, you should actually see details underneath this portion right here, the 
protocols, the local addresses, and foreign addresses, because that would show you the local connections. All right, so using Netstat, I'm going on to part D as in dog. Using Netstat, we can use additional commands to play with the uh, highlight or the, to play with or and highlight some adjustments for certain services. All right, so we're going to do a sudo netstat tac t u n a p. This allows us to do multiple options, and essentially the the tuna app basically just adjusts the output for netstat. Here is our local connections our protocols TCP and TCP v6 the addresses these are wildcard basically and they're they're listening for everything and they're listening for everything coming in on all ports and here we have what programs are being used nginx ssh and python 2.7 so what's the meaning of the t the u the n the a and the p for netstat well, because, I mean, we did a, a tag T-U-N-A-P. Well, let's find that out. If we do a man, netstat, we can see all of the commands. So we're looking for in. So these for uh, verbose n is tcp u is udp n is in numeric a is n i don't see oh, all and then p is for program basically we're saying look and include all TCP, UDP, numeric, and all programs. So, is the order of the options important? Well, let's do U and A P T. So we'll do T at the end it shows the same results. What happens if I do them backwards? P-A-N-U-T. Same results. So the order doesn't particularly matter as long as all of the switches are there. So that completes subpart B. So in, uh, does the order matter? No. So clients, as they connect to a port, again, you should see that they should be IP address, colon, that will be a port number. So here we're listening on any addresses, but on port 80. There is no foreign address. We're also listening on port 21 and port 22. Our double colons are because that's IPv6. But again, when we're looking through this, that's what that means. So... Looking at the lab guide, the first column shows the layer 4 protocol, TCP or UDP. The third column will show you the local address in the, in the address colon port format to display the local address. Again, the quad zeros signify the server is currently listening on all addresses. Fourth column, again, foreign addresses following the address colon port number, again, the quad zeros with the star means no remote devices are currently utilizing that connection. If there was, then you could see a connection with randomized port number. The fifth column is the state of the connection. That's where it says state, they're listening. The sixth column displays the process ID or PID. And with that, you're going to see our PID 398. And that is the Python program. Our Nginx is PID 647. And the program name is 
our nginx and so forth so based on the net set output below in item d what is the layer 4 protocol status and pid on port 80 PID 647 program engine X. It is using port 80 with a local address. There is no foreign address connected to it, and the current state is listening. All right, that takes care of part D. Now we're moving to part E as an echo. Sometimes it's useful to pull information from multiple things like netset and PS. So based on certain output, you can kind of pull them together. Maybe we want to see what information we are pulling. So our NGINX, or at least my NGINX, happens to be 647. So I'm going to clear my screen. All right, I will do a sudo ps tag elf. The pipe command, that's the command above enter. That's the straight line. We're going to use grep. And in this example, it says use grep 398 or 395. Well, that isn't what I wanted. I want my variation for Nginx. So instead of grepping, 395, I'm going to grep 647. So you're going to have to adjust yours, whatever your NGINX PID is. And there we go. It can pull the information specifically dealing with NGINX. So in the output, again, the PS command is piped through grep to pull the information using the appropriate PID. Again, lab guide says 395. That's because in the lab guide, their PID for their NGINX was 395. Mine is 647, and yours may be slightly different. So you need to choose your appropriate one. And you'll notice the way the column is broken down. We have a time component now. So the first column the first line shows a process owned by root, and that started the process 647 at that given time, 1352. The third or the second line shows the PID, the following PID, 648, which that was started by the HTTP user slash service. And that was started at 13.52. And that PID was slightly modified to 6.48. However, it is still directly related to the parent PID of 6.47. That's why it's being listed. And in the process ID that all started this was, again, my variation of NGINX, which was my PID of 6.47. So again, you have to select your PID and answer the questions accordingly. So what is NGINX? What's its function? It's a new form of web server. It did a lot more than that, but essentially that's what it is. All right, so it also pointed out that the second line is owned by HTTP and it's, it's a user and has the process uh, ID of 648 or is something closer to what our process ID for Nginx is. And again, yours might be slightly different. So why is the last line showing grep 3? Mine is showing grep 647. Because again, I just ran that. That was my command. And that's why we have a different PID. But because we're looking for anything that is dealing with whatever uh, PID we pulled into, that's why it's listing me. So this is me. This is my requests. And this is the grep 4647 because that was my request. All right, so that takes care of part one. 
subparts A, B, C, D, and E. Now we can move on to part two, using Telnet to test TCP-based services. All right, so part one, we identified Nginx running. We know that Nginx is a lightweight web server running on port 80. While it is strongly recommended that SSH be used as the remote shell application instead of Telnet, well, we can still use Telnet. So the question is, what if an attacker changed the name of a malware program to Nginx just to make it look like a popular web server? Using Telnet to connect to the local address, can we, can we do that? So actually, let's go ahead and do that. Again, normally, we'd be using SSH. But in our example, we can use Telnet. We're trying to connect over Telnet. All right, so I'm gonna send a few characters. And you're gonna notice I now get a bad request. We cannot find page HKJ, HJK, HJK, HK. It's a bad request. Essentially, it's just saying they can't find whatever I'm trying to type in. Thanks to the Telnet protocol, a clear text TCP connection was established by the Telnet client directly to the Nginx server listening on that port. This connection does allow us to send the data directly to the server. Nginx is a web server. It does not understand the sequence of random information. It was a page error because, again, we just sent a random amount of information. So while it did decline our web request, it did actually give us information. We did find out our PID request. We did find out the version of Nginx. Our Nginx is 1.16.1. .1. We did get a uh, content length. The network stack of our workstation is fully functional clearly all the way up to layer seven. So we got to keep in mind, not all network services are equal. Some services are designed to accept unformatted data and not terminate. Some are designed to terminate if they get garbage. So let's go and let's look at Netstat that we looked at earlier to see if it's possible to see the process attached to port 22. So what we're going to do is change our address and connect to port 22. Notice that's SSH. Again, I'm going to give it random numbers. Notice, gives us no detail. It just straight says connection invalid, connection closed. Done. Advantages Oh, sorry, uh, using Telnet, connect to port 68. So we'll do one more. So port 68 straight refused the connection. It will not allow a connection or a Telnet connection to that port number. So not all services are willing or able to accept incoming requests from Netstat. Reflection questions. What are the advantages of using Netstat? It's quick, it's easy, it's simple, it's built in. What are the advantages of using Telnet? Again, it's it's quick, it's easy. Oops, sorry. First one was Netstat, not Telnet. Netstat gives us detailed information about connections. Telnet gives us detailed connection uh, opportunity. Telnet allows us to send plain text requests over to different labs or different services to see what they respond with. 
Sometimes they get responses, sometimes they don't. So it's a way for us to uh, use Telnet for basic reconnaissance. It has been replaced by SSH with encryption, but some companies still use Telnet. All right, that is the end of this lab. Again, this was lab 4.3.4, exploring Linux server. Thank you. All right, so that does it for this lab video. A few suggestions would be, one, run through the lab a second time, trying to do it by yourself. Two, I would do a summary of kind of what you learned, where you struggled, and keep that type of journal going so that you can build off of it. Third, and finally, take time to reflect. These labs start off fairly easy and then they grow in complexity, so some of the labs you may have to redo a few times to fully grasp what's going on. If you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.